Alors, euh, il me fait plaisir de vous accueillir à la conférence d'honneur Nicole et Bacher. Euh, et euh, j'ai le plaisir de vous présenter une, euh, une personne que j'aime beaucoup, qui fut longtemps ma collègue et dont je m'ennuie, Dr. Mary Egan. Alors, euh, Mary, Mary Egan est notre récipiendaire cette année du prix Nicole et Bacher. Et il est bon de rappeler qui est Nicole et Bacher. Alors, à votre sortie, n'hésitez pas à prendre connaissance de, de, de celle qui fut une des pionnières dans notre programme et qui nous a beaucoup apporté. Et c'est en l'honneur de tout le travail de cette femme-là qu'on a créé le prix Nicole et Bacher. Et notre sixième récipiendaire est cette année, Madame Mary Egan. Mary euh, a exercé à titre de clinicienne une dizaine d'années avant de devenir, avant de s'investir de de, de, de dans une visée académique. Alors euh, concrètement, euh, ah, j'ai même pas noté la date où tu es devenue une bachelière. C'est ça, c'est fin. Chut. Ça doit être un acte manqué. Alors, alors euh, Mary euh, euh, a eu une maîtrise de l'Université d'Alberta en 1991 et a terminé son euh, doctorat à McGill en épidémiologie et en statistique en 1999. Euh, elle a, euh, elle a euh, investi l'enseignement euh, à diverses universités, alors euh, McGill a eu le privilège de l'avoir euh, quelques années, mais elle a passé le plus clair de son temps à être un professeur associé à l'Université d'Alousie euh, pendant une euh, quatorzaine d'années, genre, et à l'Université d'Ottawa depuis 1999, où je l'ai connue. Euh, elle est associée à plusieurs projets de recherche et plusieurs équipes de recherche. Alors, entre autres, euh, elle est au Centre de recherche en soins pour les personnes âgées de, du Centre euh, hospitalier Elisabeth Bruyère à Ottawa. Elle est aussi associée euh, au Partenariat canadien pour le rétablissement après un ACV de la Fondation des maladies du cœur et des ACV. Elle est associée au programme d'épidémiologie clinique de, 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 euh, qui est un institut de recherche de, de l'hôpital d'Ottawa. Euh, elle a connu, elle a, elle a commis de nombreuses présentations et de nombreuses publications dont je vous épargnerai la liste, euh, mais elle a aussi, euh, de ce fait, été récipiendaire de plusieurs prix prestigieux au Canada. Euh, notamment, elle a remporté un, un Golden Quill Award, qui est le prix pour l'article, le, le meilleur article de l'année de la CE en 2012. Something like that. Elle a, elle a aussi eu un Silver Quill Award de l'Association des, des physiothérapeutes du Canada, mais... <rires> oui, oui, on, on peut rayonner. <rires> mais euh, certainement, euh, la plus belle carte d'honneur qu'elle a à, à son jeu est d'avoir été la récipiendaire d'un prix Muriel Driver, qui est la plus haute distinction qu'une ergothérapeute peut avoir au Canada, qui est décernée par l'Association canadienne des ergothérapeutes, ce qui fait d'elle une fellow. Euh, on est très privilégié de l'avoir avec nous cet après-midi. Et euh, connaissant Mary, euh, elle, elle risque de nous proposer une réflexion euh, intéressante, euh, peut-être de nous, nous forcer à réfléchir davantage à la notion de risque. Alors, euh, sa présentation porte là là-dessus, et je lui laisserai le, le plaisir de l'introduire. Mais je dois vous dire que... Euh, Mary est plus confortable en anglais, donc elle a choisi de faire sa présentation en anglais, mais toutes les acétates seront en français. Et je vais vous assurer qu'Andrew et moi, on se fera un plaisir, si vous avez des questions ou des remarques, de traduire au besoin dans un sens comme dans l'autre. Alors, que chacun parle dans la langue où il est confortable et profitons de, profitons de la présence de Dr. Egan avec nous. Alors, euh, Dr. Egan, it's your turn. Je veux commencer par euh, donner un grand merci à, à, à Professeur Freeman et à Professeur Valley et à tout le, le, le comité. Euh, C'est un tellement grand honneur d'être ici à Laval et euh, le, le, le premier, la première université du Canada et du Québec. Et euh, euh, oui, et comme euh, euh, Dr. Valley a dit, euh, je vais donner le discours en anglais. Uh, J'ai été, uh, j je suis née uh, avant le, le grand projet d'immersion française uh, en Ontario, mais uh, c'était un uh, gros projet de, de mes parents d'avoir des enfants uh, bilingues. Uh, uh, malheureusement, le projet est uh, toujours, uh, 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 c'est pas, c'est pas encore uh, tout à fait. Uh, 
fini, tout à fait terminé. Alors, je vais, euh, je vais parler en anglais, mais je vous invite de, de me poser des questions ou des, des discussions en, en français. Uh, all right, so see, it's also a great honor to be here and see your projects, the, the projects de définissant. And um, uh, because I, as I go further and further along in my life, I find I'm returning to the questions that I had as a student. The questions that I was asking uh, when I was a student are the ones that I'm finally saying, okay, I really need to think about this. So um, please uh, you keep in mind your wonderful questions from your projects and the wonderful questions that you have as, as new, new clinicians as well. So I had a, a couple of big questions as a new graduate and they were about, um, and I did, I graduated in 1982, okay, you can do the math. Um, but um, it, we were just starting to talk about enabling occupation at that time. Thelma Assumption, who was one of my profs, got everyone together around the guidelines of practice that CAOT first developed and is continuing to develop, which is such an incredible project. When I can come here, or you can come to Ottawa, or you can go to UBC, and we're all talking about the same thing. It's wonderful. They don't have that in the US. They have a little bit of it in Australia, but it's just been something wonderful. So I learned that as a, as a student, my job was to help people get back to doing the things they wanted to do. But I didn't know how to do that. I, that was my big question. How do you do that? How does it happen? I'll be talking about that a little bit today. But the other question I had as a new OT was, what about this risk safety thing? Because we seem to, we don't talk about it that much in school. At least I don't think we talk a lot about it in the classroom. We talk a lot about it in the clinic. A lot of our team meetings, that's the big question, right? And I can remember the first time somebody asked me that, you know, is the person safe to get in and out of the tub? Is the person safe to make a meal? And then, oh my gosh, is this person safe to go home? And I can remember thinking, why are you asking me? <laughs> I don't know. Um, <laughs> And then I thought, okay, well, as an, as an OT, I'm very good at observing people. I really am. I do activity analysis. I can break things down. I know my kinesiology. I know my neuro, phys, neuro, neuro stuff. Yeah, <laughs> I'm sure there's a better word for that. So I, I know the kinds of problems people might have, and I, I can watch and see if those are, are really being played out. Um, but then, as I started doing this, I started to have real problems with how typically we look at safety and risk. And, um, and I had three big problems with it. One of them was, I wasn't sure. Um, I felt that if I was going to be telling someone, you should not do this, stop doing this. If I was going to tell them that, I should be pretty sure that they were going to have a really serious problem really quickly, okay? I, in order, I, I felt very strongly about that, and I didn't feel I had a very good sense of it. Um, the other thing that made me think was, I, when I, I had the impression that people were not following my recommendations, okay? <laughs> and I thought, you know, I don't think everybody in the world is really stubborn, you know? Maybe, maybe it's not, it may, or maybe they just know something I don't know. And, and the third thing, which I'm gonna have to look up now. Okay, oh yeah, okay. So the third thing was, I thought, really, is, is what I'm really doing, does that really require, at that time it was four years of university? Or, because it just seemed very robotic. You know, like Siri could do it. And, uh, you know, here is the list of potential problems. Do you have a scatter rug? Check. Get rid of the scatter rug. Check. And, you know, really, does that really, and I, I, it, it bothered me. So the other thing that I found was that when I put that aside and I just said to people, what are you worried about? You know, what are you really concerned about? 
and we just got to talking. Oh, and the other thing that I did, which really freaks out my students because I tell them you have to do this, is I said to them, look, I am not interested in telling you not to do stuff. I am not interested in sending you to a nursing home. And I think, you know, the thing is, at that time, for people who were in their 70s and their 80s, that was a really big reality. Somebody could walk into your hospital room and sign the form and send you to a nursing home. So I had to reassure people I wasn't interested in that. And I had to do that. Nowadays, it's, I was just talking to my mom this morning. She, um, she got her license renewed, yay! Um, and that's the big concern now. Eh? We, won't, we won't go down that driving road today, but we'll talk more about just this, this typical safety practice in the clinic. Um, so I thought, really, this seems to work out better. I seem to be able to make more of a difference when I say to people, look, I'm not interested in telling you not to do stuff, and what are you really worried about? Um, but so I, I don't have patience anymore. It's very easy for me to say that. It's very easy for me to tell my students to do that. Um, and they tell me, are you seriously, really? You really think we can do that? We can't do that. We've got a whole team that expects us to go down this checklist, okay? And we have 10 patients we have to see. On a, on a slow day, we have to see 10 patients. So we, there's just no way to do that. So I just got very depressed. But then I thought, okay, wait. I, I do see places, I do run into OTs that tell me that they are able to practice like that. They are able to ask people, what are you worried about? They are able to put aside the checklist for a little while. So how do we do that? If we know that can be done, how do we do it? So I, I you know, this is basic client center practice, right? So I read you know, Mary Law and Thelma Sumption and, and Gail Restall and all those people, but I still wasn't exactly sure how to put it into place. And it, it really bothered me. And I thought, you know, I don't really have, yeah, it bothered me. So I just sort of did nothing for a while. And then I ran into a nursing researcher at the University of Alberta named Christine Cece. She is brilliant. She's a nursing philosopher. She's a lovely person. I got to work with her afterwards. But what she said was that if, if you have these real roadblocks in practice, if what you're doing doesn't seem to be working, it's important to, to step back and think about what, um, what framework you're using to, to look at the problem. And um, I, I, um, okay. So in um, when we were when we huh, when Andrew and Chantal were um, tr tr um, translating the slides, the framework, the word seemed to be lentille. That seemed to be the idea. Is what what lentille are you using? And so if you think about even. Um, uh, binoculars. You know, you put on your binoculars and the minute you do, everything focuses here and you can't see the things over there. So what, what lentille are you using? And um, so is this, um, okay, where are we here? Okay, now the thing that blew me away about what Chris said was it's the choice of a lens, it's a political decision. This just made all the difference in the world to me. And she said, by that, and this is very Foucault, but by that we mean that um, there are a number of potentially valid frameworks that you could use. They're all potentially valid. It's not like there's one wrong one or one bad one. And so I thought, well, what's the lens that we're using to look at this problem of risk? And I think, I'll let you read this. Uh, yep, yeah, no, we did that. Okay, oh. Sorry. The, uh, so the other, so just to give an example is, um, so government, for example, is the, the role of government is to produce a good country, a good, and, and there are different ideas about what a good country is. So for example, for les conservateurs, a good country is a place where people are really free to make money. Um, because once you have money, then you can get good things, and you, 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 we're not going to tell you what those good things are. That's up to you. We're just going to help you. Um, be in a situation where you can make money. So there's not a lot of regulation and different things. For the MPD, um, it, the good society is where people, it's, things are more equalized and people have the same amounts of opportunities to, to, to get goods and, and education and things like that. And so there's a lot of regulation and a lot of structure. But there, you know, there are two valid ideas about what a good society is. And it's the same thing for us. There's all these different valid frameworks. Okay, but what framework are we using? Well, I think this is how we think about um, safety and risk in OT, and I'll let you read that. 
Um, if you can't see it, ask the person next to you. Okay, so something has happened to our patients. They've had an illness or an injury. Their bodies, their brains have changed somewhat. And we think they really, they're now at risk. They're now at risk to fall. They're now at risk to burn themselves. We don't, they don't understand those risks. We do, we've studied this. And so we have to convince them that they are at risk. And then we have to get them to do what we uh, you know, know is best for them to do. Okay, and so what framework is this? This is the medical model, right? Okay, this is the idea that there's a certain problem that the professional diagnoses, okay, and that um, giving the, the patient their responsibility is to uh, present themselves for assessment and, and answer questions, but then the, the, the professional makes the opinion about what's wrong and tells the patient what to do, and it's the patient's responsibility to follow those instructions. That's the medical model. Now, I don't want you to think that I am trashing the medical model. The medical model is wonderful. If I start to have problems speaking. That might not be a good example because sometimes I do have problems speaking. But, but if I, 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 you know, that kind of stuff where I can't lift my arms or, um, you know, if my, part of my face starts to droop, okay, well, you guys know what this is, right? I might be having a stroke, okay? Do you ask me what would you like to do? <laughs> what are you worried about? No! you get me to emergency really, really, really fast because I need to see a doctor, okay? And I need to just submit to that assessment and do whatever he or she tells me to do. Or I could die, okay? No more goals for me. No more occupation for me in this life. So, um, so the medical model is really important there, okay? Now, if it's six months from now or three months from now and, um, and you're my OT, and you're seeing me at home, and I'm, for instance, having trouble with my balance, and I don't look that great on the stairs. And I have stairs in my house up to my bedroom. And uh, you may say, you know, we've done the stairs, and you don't look so great. I think you could fall. I think you have to move your bed downstairs. And we're, we're in my house. So there's a nice little nook there. My, my living room kind of goes like this. And so there is a place you could put a bed there. And there's a bathroom downstairs. It could all work out. So you say, you've got to do this. And probably what I'm going to do is say nothing. And I'm going to try to get out of OT as quickly as I can. Because I don't want my bed downstairs. And in fact, um, sure, there's a physical risk that I could fall on the stairs. But there are other problems if I have my bed downstairs. First of all, I won't be sleeping with my husband anymore. And um, I, I really, we, we would really need that intimacy at this point in our, in our relationship. Um, the other thing is I have a 16-year-old son, and he's a really good kid, but he's a 16-year-old boy, and I need to keep an eye on him. And fortunately, he usually brings his friends home. But can imagine a bed in the living room. Th these kids aren't coming to our house anymore. They will find somewhere else to go, and I will no longer be able to keep tabs on them. I won't be able to see what they're doing. So there, if you gave me permission to talk about this, I, I would probably tell you about it. But I would need permission. You would have to say, you know, this may not be a good idea, um, or I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna force you to do this. And that, I think that's the other thing sometimes we forget is how um, vulnerable our patients are, okay? You know, what could happen if I don't do this? What could this person do to me? It, 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 you, you know, I, I think, yeah, and I'm, you know, I'm a little bit older. I know that professionals can do things to people, probably not so much anymore. But anyway, I digress. So, <laughs> ha, so the thing, though, is how the problem is, you know, if, how do you describe what this is? What kind of lens is this? And I find, well, of course, it's client-centered practice, right? But I find that's kind of fuzzy. And, and when you talk to other team members about it, they go, oh, isn't that sweet? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's really precious. But you know, you know, grow, yeah, I, I know. I, I, maybe I'm, may, on a, it could happen. OK, so 
So how do you describe it differently? And I think um, there is a framework from humanistic psychology that would work. There's some good things and bad things about it being from humanistic psychology, but at least it's recognizable. So I am suggesting this. Oh, okay, so this is, sorry, this is, I've gone through my slides. Um, so the problem with the medical model when in, a, in, in chronic problems is that you've got a limited number of problems and causes, it's all for the professional. Okay, oh boy, my slides got out of, okay. Yeah, I know I'm out of swing. Okay, but that's okay. Okay, so what the other thing about risk, so that's the problem with looking at risk as a medical model. It only has physical risk in it, and the professional is the expert, the patient has nothing to say, blah, blah, blah. There's another problem with looking at risk as only physical and always a bad thing and something that has to be contained. And this was from my other question that I asked 30 years ago as a student, well, more than 30, okay. But, um, you know, how do people get back into their valued activities? And um, with the grant from Heart and Stroke, we followed 67 people who had had a stroke, and we uh, visited them at uh, 6, 9, 12, 18, and 24 months after their stroke. And for a small number of them, we did a very intensive qualitative component to, um, and asked them about their activities and what they could get back into and what they, how they did it. And we found there were three things that were super important for people to get back to their activities. And one was they had to have this social connection. But it wasn't a social connection about, you know, I will take you swimming or I will take you to, you know, your club. It wasn't about that. It was a group that they did their activity with and they, um, they, uh, that they wanted to get back to. They wanted to be a member of that group again. They wanted to give back to that group. Um, so if it was someone that, you know, they were the person that was always cheerful, they wanted to be at that meeting and be that cheer everybody up. One man, he wanted to get back to shoveling the snow because his wife had done all these things for him and he wanted to do that for her. You can imagine an OT recommending that somebody go out that's had a stroke six months ago and shovel snow. We would never do that, right? we need to start doing more. Anyway, so they, they had to, it was part of, you You had to look at the activity in their social, as, as part of their social, and what was their role in it, what did they, how did they reciprocate with the people. Um, and then they had to have this control, they had to have autonomy, they had to be in control of how they would do that activity, when and with whom, and all those things. And if those two things were present, then they tried it. They took a risk. Going out to shovel the snow six months after a stroke, you're taking a risk, okay? We, I have a, a, a doctoral student, Dorothy Kessler, uh, doing a, an intervention based on this and other things. And um, she, uh, she had a gentleman that got back onto his boat to go fishing with balance problems, you can imagine. So, so there was a risk, so they had to take this risk. And what happened when they take the, the risk is they either succeeded, they did the activity, and if they did, then they just tried more stuff. And if they didn't, it wasn't terrible either because what they went was, oh, I guess I have to find a different way, which is what we're always trying to do as OTs, right? We're always trying to tell them, you gotta do this a different way. What you, it's probably more effective to have them try it and then they see, oh, I have to do it a different way. So, so, that, so that's why risk, we can't, Look, if we're going to help people get back into their valued activities, we can't look at risk as something terrible, never do it, only physical, okay? So how do we look at it? Well, here's the humanistic psychology thing. So this is the alternative lens, so I'll let you read that. Okay, so um, safety isn't an outcome. Well, it's not a final outcome. It's something that we have to feel in order to take risks, as living is all around taking risks, right? Um, becoming an OT student, that was, a, that was a risk, right? Going on those clinical placements, bit of a risk, right? So it's, it's, but you have to feel a certain amount of safety to get to that point. And so, and this is from humanistic psychology, and I'm going to talk about two, um, two groups of, uh, in humanistic psychology. One is Maslow, of course, and the other one is uh, Ryan and Deci, but we'll, we'll see that in a sec. Now, um, okay. Okay. 
and we just said that. Okay, so I know you have seen this a million times and you're sick of it and all that, but just bear with me for a minute because I think there are really two important things we don't always think about as OTs. And Maslow, his great pyramid, he was interested in why, uh, how people uh, have this self-actualization, how they become the people that they, the best people that they could be, the happiest, the healthiest, um, the most uh, contributing to their society, those kinds of things. And he had a lot of different ideas about this, but throughout his life he felt that there were really two, um, two types of needs. And the first two needs, those physiological needs for food and water and shelter and sexual intimacy and safety and security, he called them deficits needs. They were D needs. And what he meant was that they, you had to feel that they were adequately met, adequately fulfilled, before you could move on to doing anything else. And um, for me, the real key there was it's a subjective, um, it's, it's subjective, okay? So what you might need to feel safe might be very different from what I need. Well, there's some basic stuff, but, but you really have to ask the person in order to determine whether those needs have been met. Now, what do OTs have to do with meeting those needs? Well, I was quite surprised to see that actually quite a lot. I'm going to tell you about four people and, uh, and how these, these needs were met. And the first one is Dan. And Dan, um, uh, the first two people were seen by an occupational therapist, Ruth Whiting. And Ruth had been hired by the Stroke Survivors Association in Ottawa to do navigation services. And this was to really anyone <laughs> SSAO, they think big. So they said, okay, we want someone that can go in and find out what the needs are and get them met. So they hired an OT, of course, right? I thought that was a great thing. And uh, so she just went around to people and asked them, you know, what, what do you need to have a, a better life? And uh, um, so two examples. One was Dan, and Dan probably in his late 30s, early 40s, and his stroke was because he had been assaulted. He had been beaten up um, in his apartment in Lower Town in Ottawa. And uh, so uh, he was back in his apartment, but he was really scared because um, the people, the friends of the, pe the person that beat him up kept coming over and threatening him and stuff like that. And so he really needed to get a new apartment. But it was social housing, so he had to go to the authorities in Ottawa and he had to say, look, I have to change my apartment unit. And he'd been there a couple of times and gotten nothing done. So Ruth went with him and the people didn't show up and then so they went a second time. And, um, and Dan said, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to read the quote because it's, it's just lovely. He said, okay. <laughs> This is where you cut this part out of the tape? No. Okay, so they said, Ottawa housing was giving me the runaround. Because of Ruth, the OT, I got my first choice of apartments. She went with me to Ottawa housing and talked to the people there and me. Because of my stroke, I'm not always 100%. I don't ask the right questions and make the right comments. And she was looking over my situation and because of her, I got the perfect unit for myself. Uh, she explained to the housing people that for my security, I needed a new unit. And I'm going to be happy in my new place. So this was an OT intervention where it really dealt with, with those issues. And you can imagine, you can imagine, you know, Dan describes this very, very well, but you can imagine when his, when, when his housing is on the line, he's, he, he probably did get very nervous in front of those folks and he needed, uh, he needed Ruth's help. Okay, the second person was Norma, and Norma... Not good. Okay. Norma uh, in, in her late 70s, and she was uh, married to Bob, who'd had a stroke. And uh, this uh, CCAC, which is our sort of CLSC, um, uh, came in and said, you know, you, you're responsible for this part of his care. You, you have to do this. And, uh, and there were a number of things that, that uh, Norma was really scared to do. And she said, uh, she said, we were told it was taken for granted that I would attend to his needs. Ruth, the OT, said she was appalled that a woman my age with osteoporosis would be expected to have the physical ability to intervene if, if he lost his balance. So I, 
We, Ruth and I, we arranged for things to be as safe as possible. Now I, Norma, assess the risk with everything. I decided I was no longer able to see Bob safely up the stairs. She couldn't help him up the stairs. She can see him downstairs, but she said, if he falls on me, it's over for both of us. And so um, with Ruth's help, she was able to get help with the things Bob needed to do so she wouldn't have to help him up the stairs. And um, this was, and so, you know, they were both able to go on and, and have these, these needs met. So um, Ruth gave Norma a language, um, some tools for assessing risk, and a way to talk to the, the case manager to get the help she needed. Okay. So, um, and I presented this to uh, the Family Medicine Research Unit, and they said, you know, I can see maybe how the second one was OT, but not the first one. It seems more social work. But I think if we think more of our intervention as helping people feel safe, get to that place where they feel safe, that it makes sense that this is OT as well. Okay, so I'll talk to you about, oh yeah, okay. Now, the best thing I have ever done as a prof happened ex accidentally. Um, I won't tell you the whole thing, but I ended up teaching a course that happened in a, the middle of a placement. And um, uh, so I knew I had the opportunity to do something around motivation. The course was on motivation. So I asked uh, students to identify a patient in their placement who didn't seem motivated, who was unmotivated, and then to apply some theories of motivation and try to change the intervention a bit, see what happens. And I had amazing, amazing stories. My students were amazing. But I'll tell you, the one I probably the one I liked the best was, um, all these names are not real names, by the way, but they are real people, um, except for the, the therapist. Uh, Joelle Vautour was the student, and she had a patient, David. And David was in his early 60s, and he'd had a T2 a lesion and a skiing accident. So this was a man fairly well off, fairly physically fit, um, had this uh, paraplegia. And um, he was in the rehab center, was there about two weeks, and really doing nothing. He was in a tilt recline power chair. He refused to look at any other kind of wheelchair. He was afraid of that, and, and, he, um, and he wasn't doing really that much in therapy at all. And nobody could figure out why. And um, so what Joelle did was she just sat down with him to talk to him about, you know, what was he concerned about? And when she talked to him, she was struck by the fact that he really couldn't see how he could ever get home again. And um, uh, what happens in that rehab unit is that it's, a, it's an excellent rehab unit. But what happens is that they, you know, you have your clinical path. So this is when we do this, and this is when we do this, and this is when we do this. And here, you know, you do all your therapy, and then a week before you go home, you have your home visit. And she said, no, I think he needs to get home now. He needs to see that this is possible. And she convinced the whole team that, that to, to allow this to happen. And then um, uh, she um, met with him there. And then three days later, he and his wife met with a contractor. And the contractor had all these wonderful ideas about what could be changed. And so all of a sudden, he had a home again. You know, and then the, she, you know, the rest of the team talked, and they made wheelchair mobility a real, the biggest, uh, the biggest issue in therapy and whatnot. So, so, and, and he, of course, went on to to do um, the, the one of their most highly motivated patients. So, so that kind of, of thing again, this place of safety. He had to he had to feel like he had he had a home. Um, okay. And it wouldn't have been possible with the medical model because the medical model says, okay, this is the time you do this. This is the time you do that. Okay, other students uh, made similar progress. Um, and I wanted, we've been talking about um, physical things and I just wanted to talk briefly about Melanie who um, was seen by our OT at the university clinic. And she has developmental coordination disorder, so she has difficulty learning new motor tasks. But with co-op, she's learned different sports and she's, she's been great. But um, when she was in grade seven, she couldn't do her lock to get into her, her cassier because, um, because uh, he, uh, you know, the DCD. And so Jose at our clinic worked with her and she managed to do it within a session. It was great. But then when she went back to school, she shared her locker with another student and the other student was going, come on, you know, you're so slow. What do you mean? You're, you, this is taking forever. Why are you so slow at everything? And of course, Melanie just stopped using the locker and, and didn't 
you know, it wasn't safe for her to do this. And so safety as a social safety thing, and you think, well, what do we do about this? Well, of course, the social environment is part of our model. We can have a, we can do that, and, and teachers, good teachers do that all the time. Eh? They tell students, other students, look, that's not okay. You can't do that to this student. And, and so we need to be prepared to intervene in the social environment as well. Okay, so where are we? Okay, now, oh yeah. Okay, I, this does have implications if we're really interested in safety um, for our lives as citizens as well. Um, while whether your safety needs are met is subjective, there is kind of a lower level which makes it really, really difficult uh, financially to meet your basic needs. And I wanted to illustrate this because it was just so uh, incredible. So in our stroke project, as I said, we followed people at those times and we used the reintegration to normal living index to measure participation. So 110 on this scale means, yes, I'm doing everything I want to do in my community, in my home, everything exactly the way I want, it's great. And 11 means I'm not doing anything. Um, and um, so you can see that for, uh, we looked at the, our, our participants in neighborhoods and in the people who were in neighborhoods when there, where there is more than $20,000 uh, family income, you can see they start off at 85 and they move to 91, so they make a nice, a nice progression. In neighborhoods with less than $20,000 a year for the family, they started off at 61. This, these, this is amazing. It was just like we couldn't believe the difference and they don't really go anywhere. They don't really progress at all. Um, and so the, the message, I think, for us as OTs, we have to uh, really uh, at least know, at least vote, at least know where the people that are running stand on income security and what they are prepared to do about it. Because without income security, you're not, you're not doing a lot of occupations. At least that's what, that's what we're seeing here. Okay. Again, so... Um, okay, yes, this is where we get to Ryan and to see. Okay, now I was talking about Maslow before, and you know, you, anybody you talk about Maslow, they're going to be, oh, that was in the 1950s, you know, come on, it's never really been proven, blah, blah, blah. This is not completely true because of these two guys, Richard Ryan and Edward Deceen. Now, is, do you, have you been exposed? Better say yes. <laughs> <laughs> it's okay. My students do the same thing. Um, absolutely the same thing. Okay, so Ryan and Desi, they're, they're, two, uh, they're, they're probably the world's hottest psychologists at the moment. Um, and they, uh, have, they started looking at motivation about 30 years ago, and they really looked at all of the literature and, and, um, they've d and really integrated into this theory called self-determination theory. And so basically, there's two parts, and one is says that um, people, people are motivated to do things. We are born with motivation. It's pure Kiel Hoffner, right? You're, you're, just, you're born wanting to do things. Um, but, uh, and and we, we, we all want to do things uh, for, oh, now I'm going to have to look this up. See, I don't even know. There we go. Okay. Autonomy, competency, and... Uh, relationships, yes. Oh, I, that's wonderful. Yes. Okay. So we're all <laughs> we're all motivated to do different things, um, and because through the things we do, we develop, we we express autonomy, uh, competency, and relatedness. And uh, so, and and they say, well, you could ask them, well, what is it that that does those things? Like, what activities do those things, right? And they would say, well, it's different for everybody. We really can't tell which is great because that's why you need OTs to go and, and use tools like personal project analysis to determine, well, what is it that you want to do? What, what's that thing that you love to do? How do you express your autonomy, your, your competence, and how do you relate to other people through, through occupation? Because we can't guess what that is until we talk to you. So, so that's really exciting. And their stuff really comes, Maslow is at the base of all their stuff. Um, the other thing that they, so they say 
that really what you need to do is to set up the conditions that allow people to do the things that they love, to do their occupation significative. And one of the conditions that you set up, of course, is that safety. And, and then you kind of get out of the way. But what we're also finding in our stroke research, um, uh, Dorothy Kessler and I, uh, well, Dorothy mainly, Dorothy should take all the credit for it. Did I do my commercial yet? Oh, I'm also the chair of our PhD program in rehabilitation sciences, and it's a great program, and we do have admission scholarships. So if you're interested in a PhD, <laughs> no, I'm serious. And, um, and we do take people directly from the master's program. So come and, so send me an email or come and talk to me. Okay, so Dorothy and I, but me, okay. <laughs> <laughs> Dorothy and I, mainly Dorothy, have been looking at this for a long time, and um, so Dorothy is, uh, and I shouldn't, I, anyway, you, you, can, you can write Dorothy about this, but she's got uh, the publication in CJOT about occupational performance coaching, she's got the, and, and her results are just coming out, and um, so she, it's this method to, to help people get back into their things, and we keep thinking that um, uh, because we're using uh, the COPM, we have to ask the control group, she, we didn't do this, she did this. She had to ask the control group what they wanted to do, right? Because if you want to compare with the COPM, she had this control group. And we are starting to be convinced, we did another project like this before, we're starting to be convinced that even asking people what it is they want to do is really therapeutic. Because it does a couple of things. One is it gets them thinking. And the, um, the nice thing about the heavy duty neuroscience stuff is that, that that's, it really it, that supports it, getting people thinking about what they do, getting them envisioning. I saw some things about, yeah, envisioning. And the other thing is it's a health professional who gives them permission. Okay, because possibly, and I don't, and definitely in acute care, possibly in rehab, a lot of people have been telling them, don't do this. You shouldn't do this. You shouldn't do that. And suddenly, someone's coming in who has a degree and, and the registration and is saying, you, you know, what do you want to do? What a good idea. You should try that. So it just, it opens up, it opens up the whole thing. And so I think if there's one thing to, well, actually I'd like you to take two things away. And one is this idea of safety um, being more like Maslow's, the base of Maslow. And it's, it's subjective. So what does that person need to get to that feeling of safety? Because once they do that, then they can jump into their activities. And another thing that helps them jump into their activities is you as an OT saying, what is it you'd like to do? What a great idea. Okay, so I think I'm gonna open it up to discussion and... Uh... Bonjour. Ma question, pour, pour, moi je travaille en gériatrie. Donc au niveau des gens qui ont une démence, par exemple, ouais. la notion de risque, quand vient le temps de dire oui, on va laisser marcher la personne, puis qu'on sent que la personne, elle, euh, ne sent pas ces, ces enjeux-là de sécurité, étant donné qu'il y a une atteinte du jugement. Je voulais voir avec vous quelle lentille ou quelle lunette ou quelle est votre perception à ce moment-là de yeah. on peut tenir compte de la perception ressentie du client. Oui, c'est une question excellente et pour euh, j'ai j'ai fait un projet récemment et on, on met à côté la question de la démence. Um, à mon avis, uh, à mon avis, uh, ok. I will switch to English. This is because it will be here all night. Um, uh, the um, I think sometimes we uh, I you know if I had to say one thing it would be read Evelyn De Roche. Yeah, and um, uh, she is a, a postdoc student at McGill right now. She just finished a PhD with Susan Rappold. Um, and she looked at this question of relational autonomy. So I think the thing is about sort of widening it a bit. Um, the other thing she talks about very much is how, um, how certain are we that they're going to have these problems? Um, and she makes this, she, the paper hasn't been published yet, I'm scooping her too, uh, but um, she looks at um, injuries from skiing. <laughs> 
people like to ski here, um, and, uh, and, and all kinds of other sports, and then injuries that people have dement, you know, older people have, and it's like, mm, do, we do, do we tell people to stop skiing? You know, I don't think we do that. We tell them to go out and get some exercise. Now, you know, you are dealing with some very complex things, in, um, especially in Canada, people wandering outside freezing to death, uh, people uh, burning themselves in their bathtubs, people, I, you know, I, I, as a clinician, I've worked with people who've had burns, seniors who've had burns. Well, actually, that's not true. One of them, we, it was they burned themselves in the bathtub, but another, you know, people are... What I'm saying is sometimes we're, we're not, I think, as imaginative in, in, in controlling the risks as we had. And I'm just thinking about a, a relative of mine, and, and, um, and she, I think she moved to an institution too early, and why someone didn't just unplug her stove, I will never know. I, I don't understand that. Why don't, we, why don't we look a little bit further? But it is a big question. Um, and I, one that I haven't addressed really well, but I, again, I would say read, read, uh, read Dr. DeRoche on this. Yeah. Did you have anything? Any other? No? Okay. Okay. What's her name again? Evelyn DeRoche. Uh, DeRoche. Mm. Yeah. Um, je travaille avec des personnes uh, atteintes de démence à domicile. Euh, prendre des risques quand la famille est derrière nous, mmh. euh, on est plus confortable. <rire> Mais quoi faire quand, est, quand la personne est isolée, qu'elle est inapte et que c'est à nous, la société, là, de, de prendre des décisions? Comment gérer ce risque? Je dois vous dire aussi, je pense que l'un de mes dreams uh, is uh, to, to, to do a certificate in ethics, um, but it's, it's also around um, some things about healthcare allocation or, or rehab allocation that I'm interested in, but I, I think, I think um, maybe the, the relational autonomy, the, the other uh, feminist ethics might provide a, a, different, a different lens for this, um, because I think, um, yeah, yeah, and there's a paper I need to write, but um, <laughs> how to look at, yeah. And you know, when it's personal too, and maybe we don't have enough opportunity to think about this personally, and I, that, that was an area of practice that I did work in, and, and I can remember, and I think, I think Evelyn talks about this too, it's kind of like you're thinking, well, what's the worst thing that can happen? And to broadening in that to think, um, leaving my home, what happens then? What's that side of the picture? You know, we, 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 we can think about all the risks that might happen if you stay in this environment, but do we think about the risks that can happen if you leave that environment, and maybe we don't, we don't put enough emphasis on that side of the equation as well. Um, it, I'm uh, the other thing, of course, that comes up is your responsibility as a registrant, um, and uh, and that's a tough one too because we um, we had a meeting about risk, uh, an interdisciplinary meeting recently, and we had a uh, we had our registrar from the Ontario College there. And she kept saying, you know, you can't get into trouble if you've really discussed this thoroughly with the person. Now, if, how do you discuss it thoroughly with the person when they're alone and they're, yeah, yeah. And I think, um, yeah, in our risk meeting, it was quite interesting because by the end of the day, we had clinicians there too. The clinicians were over here and the, and the, and the, the academics were over here. And the academics were like, we need to think about this more. And the clinicians are like, we need to know what to do now. Um, <laughs> so, so that made us think we need to get together on this, and maybe that's the thing to do is to find um, uh, some some ethics people and, and some people that are um, to to really discuss this. Maybe that's something that that um, that we can organize because it is um, we're kind of. Um, yeah, it's, it's so interesting that we're so isolated from each other now, but I have uh, Monique Lanois is uh, another person I've been working with. She's at St. Paul University, which is part of Ottawa U, um, and, and she's interested in some of these questions too, but, and, and she talks a lot about um, philosophers are really quite interested in getting into the 
the nitty gritty now, you know, they're interested in really doing practical things. So this might be an opportunity to, to, to get together with folks and, and say, I, I need some help thinking about this. And I may be thinking about it from a, a broader perspective than um, uh, Childress and Beauchamp, the, the classic, um, you know, relational autonomy, feminist ethics, those kinds of things. Really helpful, eh? Just throw in more theory. <laughs> yeah. Mary, um, implicit in your presentation, tôt, is the comparison of lentilles. And even si if an ergonomician says that, oui, je comprends, je, moi je suis confortable avec cette, toutes ces notions d'offrir de, de, les risques et gérer ça avec mes clients, tout ça, quand même, je travaille dans un système parfois qui est surtout guidé par le modèle biomédical. Mm -hmm. Donc, implicite dans ta présentation, il me semble qu'une idée de quelle est, quelles sont les compétences nécessaires pour les ergots de vendre une autre mm -hmm. façon de faire les choses. Donc, à travers tes différentes expériences, conversations avec les ergots qui essaient les choses, as-tu les, les conseils à nous donner sur qu'est-ce que tu as, as vu comme les... Euh, Compétence de succès. Thank you for that question. That's a, a really, really excellent question. How do you sell this? Um, I think uh, if you look, if you're working in a neuroscience area, um, I think a lot of things are moving towards this idea that you have to, um, even in um, constraint-induced movement therapy, which is you know as pretty much as mechanical as you can get, they say, well, unless you're doing something that means something to the person, they're not going to benefit from that. So, so starting off with what drives that patient, and the things that drive them do require risk. Um, and so you can you can if, if you're talking to someone who's really hardcore neuroscience, you can you can use that. I think as well, um, I uh, my have some expertise in evidence-based practice. Um, however, I'm always shocked, and I and my my PhD was in um, uh, pharmacoepidemiology, so it you know it, I I know doctors don't don't do this really well either in terms of, of evidence-based practice. I'm surprised at how unconvincing. Um, numbers and and the research and systematic reviews. I'm, I'm surprised at how unconvincing that is. In some ways, in some ways, I'm not. So don't feel that you need to have a systematic review, a meta-analysis. Don't feel it's okay. Nobody has really good stuff. We we have. I mean, some people do, but but in this area, we're still building that. What I would say is try a different approach with a few people. Okay, maybe start with one, start with two, document it. What does change is personal experience. So when you have your MLA and his dad has OT and it works out wonderfully, OT's gonna, yeah. So um, try it with one or two people, really document your results. I think um, uh, really tell stories, tell the stories of, of people and how it worked out. That story of David, I, I'd like to, be able to tell you more of the stories because they were amazing. They were just, um, I will tell one more story. Um, it was a story of a man and he'd had a head injury and again, uh, he just sat there in the rehab center all day, very good rehab center. And, um, and I wish I could remember the name of, the, of the, the student, but the student found out that he was interested in cooking and he had really major cognitive impairments and some physical impairments as well. She found out he was interested in cooking. He often, and he had two teenage kids and he was married. And um, he was often the cook at home. And so they, they had their whole intervention was around cooking and around him cooking a meal. And he spent a week and he chose this recipe and it was uh, chicken and peaches or something. And it was fairly complex. And he, like it, he just went from this to, you know, and he was walking around the rehab center with his recipe book and talking about it. And I, I mean, that was very, very, very powerful. So, and stories are very, very powerful. Also, we are very fortunate to have the Canadian Occupational Performance Measure, le, le CIMAP, la CIMAP, I always know the, le MCRO, la MCRO. Okay, we're very fortunate and that, that is, a, uh, that is a very simple thing to institute in practice that really does provide you with some numbers. You, you talking to anybody, you've got a story, you've got some numbers, you have some push now. Yeah. 
But it's, it's, it's and, and I think um, somebody posted, because, you know, I spend most of my life on Facebook. <laughs> and um, somebody was talking, it was a, a message, and it was a, a remembrance of Desmond Tutu, or a, 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 and it's saying, you know, the, uh, the world is going to think you're silly. You know, and I thought, wow, Desmond Tutu, you know, yeah, okay, I'll go there, I'll be silly. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> vous aviez dit que vous ne vouliez pas embarquer là-dedans en début de conférence, mais je vous relance. Vous avez brièvement parlé de la Conte du Toto. Mm. Je, je vous relance. Juste. <laughs> um, quel lien vous faites ou ne faites pas avec ces propos-là? Puis. Uh, euh, vous semblez avoir réfléchi à la question, donc euh, je vous réouvre une porte. Voir. Yeah, no, <laughs> and it's funny, you know, because you write grants and it's like, yeah, but we'll put this aside and we'll put this. No, it, it's a it's a very good question. Um, a couple of things I'd like to say, and one is I'm really proud, and I uh, I wish Martine was here, but I'm really proud of. Um, Uh, the, the stance that CAOT is taking around this, and I think it's very much around enabling. Um, I think we could have very much gone down the road of, oh, we're the best people to take people off the road, you know, and I, and I don't see CAOT doing that. I see them as, um, we're the people that are going to enable your transportation, and we're going to do it through, um, you know, a, a number of different ways, adaptation of the car, and you're going, yeah, but still, you've got these people, what are you going to do with them? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> um, I think, um, and I, you know, and it's not a cop-out, and I guess I have to do this more about personally, um, but, you know, I think we have another role in um, looking at transportation broadly and really making sure that it's that it's seniors friendly. Uh, I get on the bus now, rarely in Ottawa, and I, um, I the, uh, two times ago, um, I was knocked, I was literally knocked off my feet. The bus went so quickly, like it took off so quickly, and there were two Carlton football players that are standing next to me, and they lost their balance as well. And I'm thinking, what are we doing telling people, oh, you can take the bus? It's like, no, I can barely take the bus. So I, I think that that's um, certainly, ideally, a, a two-streamed approach. Um, I think uh, one of my uh, uh, friends, um, <laughs> this is so bad, Barb, Barb, Barb at McGill, Barb. Barbara Mazur, Barbara Mazur, um, and um, looked at um, simulations, driving simulations, and their uh, ability to really tell whether someone um, can drive or not, and um, and which is an excellent question. You know, are the things that we're doing that are are uh, that are resulting in people losing their license are they valid? And um, and I think we have uh, Barbara's research is definitely important there, and I think we have a re as researchers we have a responsibility to to make sure that that we're looking into that. Um, yeah, it um, it's it's yeah. So it's that two pronged approach, uh, three pronged. Can we do an enablement strategy? Can we really help people um, figure out transportation if driving isn't possible anymore or isn't. Uh, they're not getting their license. Um, if what are we doing in terms of supporting screening, and is that really valid? And also our role uh, in the community and in the province, uh, making sure that um, the options are there. That if you don't, if you lose your license, you're not, uh, you don't have to um, stay at home. Yeah. Bon, merci pour euh, le discours. Puis j'ai comme deux commentaires. Un, euh, comme ergo clinicienne aussi avec les personnes âgées en communauté avec un début d'émence euh, plein de risques. Euh, j'ai lu un livre dernièrement de Older Adults on Occupational Therapy. Puis il y avait une ligne qui disait les ergothérapeutes à domicile doivent prendre plus de risques. Et je, ça m'a frappé pour dire, mais je ne sais pas si c'est basé sur quoi, mais juste de voir ça imprimé sur une, dans un livre d'ergo m'a comme permis de dire ben on devrait faire ça plus parce qu'on est comme tolérance zéro pas de risque pas de chute puis dire ben c'est correct de prendre des risques puis je pense comme euh, tu dis l'autre modèle d'aller vraiment le rôle d'ergo dans c'est quoi les valeurs de clients pré mobile et souvent on regarde le rendement fonctionnel ok oui madame était capable de conduire cuisiner maintenant elle est plus capable mais est-ce qu'elle aurait il y a plein de gens, j'ai un monsieur alcoolique présentement, il aurait pris son auto à avoir bu d'alcool il y a 40 mm -hmm. ans. 
Ouais. Tu sais, il y a des gens qui n'ont pas de permis de conduire, qui conduisent euh, quand même qui est en état d'intoxication. Puis, les gens prennent des risques. Puis, ce n'est pas tous les gens âgés qui sont prudents, qui prennent leurs médicaments. Alors, est-ce que cette personne aurait pris des médicaments il y a 40 ans ou il s'en fout de ça? Puis, je pense que Dominique Giroux en parle beaucoup de ça dans la formation d'une aptitude, la gestion de risque, la notion de conséquences. Puis, on devrait peut-être mieux évaluer euh, les valeurs de la personne, mieux documenter. Puis, je pense pour moi, comme un gars, ça me sécurise pour dire j'ai fait mon évaluation, puis j'ai, la personne peut-être peut rester six mois de plus à domicile contente que la placer, quand en grève, puis même si elle chute, mais comme elle est plus prête, elle, c'est le risque, oui, elle a eu une fracture de hanche, j'ai eu un cas d'Ottawa que j'avais eu, ce qui t'a début d'émence, elle a eu une fracture, elle a eu une chute, mais elle était mieux peut-être les trois, quatre mois qu'on n'était pas certaine, elle, elle a tombé, elle a eu son fracture, mais ça fallait ça que la placer plus tôt, puis elle avait besoin de faire ce deuil, puis le fracture, oui, c'est grave, mais pour elle, c'était la, peut-être la façon pour elle de cheminer. Alors, juste mm-hmm. un petit commentaire. Yeah, I, I think it raises the really important point. It, it, it is a human rights issue because, uh, yeah, and and I think too, it's again, it's that lens. Which lens are you using? Are you using this lens of it's only physical risk? We and and you know we we understand that you don't, um, and it's the only one that's important. Um, I think um, we need to at least shift the focus and go, okay, well, what are all the other risks? What are the risks of stopping doing these activity? What is the risk of moving to a nursing home? Um, and, and I think that that will help. And, and um, yeah, and blah, blah, blah. So, yeah, there we go. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> Mary, I, uh, I even... I miss you even more. <rire> euh, ce que je me rappelle, ce que je retiens de toi, c'est, c'est cette tendance d'avoir une pensée en mouvement, à toujours vouloir réfléchir et à toujours avoir une réflexivité. Pas toujours des réponses nettes, parce que toujours ta pensée est en mouvement. Puis la présentation que tu nous as offerte, c'est un peu ça. Avoir nos pensées en mouvement, reconsidérer le, la dignité de risquer de revoir la dimension subjective du risque et, et de la sécurité aussi. C'était une présentation riche pour qu'on marche avec toi. On va continuer de marcher même sans toi, mais on te remercie beaucoup de l'avoir fait. Merci. Merci.